Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay in Washington. In September 2011, at a time when the sovereign debt raiders, as some people call them, were focusing on Italy as their next target, the European Central Bank sent a letter. Supposed to be secret, but it was leaked. And in this letter, it gave very direct instructions, you could say, to then Prime Minister Berlusconi about privatization, lowering pensions, changing hiring and firing, regulations and laws, all things one would think should be the outcome of the political process within Italy. So what is this about banks telling countries how to govern themselves? Now joining us to talk about this process in Europe and also how this shows up in the United States is Jerry Epstein. Jerry is the co-director of the Perry Institute in Amherst, Massachusetts, but today he joins us from New York. Thank you for joining us, Jerry. Thanks for having me, Paul. So t talk a bit about the significance of what happened last September, the memorandum, and, and what's happened since in terms of these quote-unquote technocrats becoming the leaders in Italy and, and Greece and, and, and the role of the banks in this process. Yeah, we have this trend uh, now where instead of democratically elected governments controlling uh, these countries, uh, so-called technocrats, the uh, central bankers, uh, are coming in, taking over as... Uh, the, the prime ministers of, of governments in Italy, uh, in Greece. Uh, in Italy, we, we have Monti, and in, in Greece, we have Papademos. Uh, these are supposed to be neutral arbiters of uh, economic policy, but in fact are mostly doing the bidding of uh, the large banks and uh, uh, the other European countries, especially Germany, that want austerity. Uh, and what's amazing to me about this is they're going way beyond uh, any kind of narrow policies with respect to debt repayment, monetary policy, but going into the deep core of social and economic policy in many of these countries. And that letter from the central bank, uh, the European Central Bank that you, you described, uh, went to the, the highly contested issues uh, that, have, that have plagued Italy for, for many years about labor laws, privatization and many others. Well, let, let's look at some of the things that they, they're demanding in this memorandum and more generally putting pressure on these governments and others. And of course, in the United States, we see very similar things where state governments have, have been elected through a supposed democratic process. I suppose people have a lot of questions about just how democratic it is for a lot of reasons, including how much money can get thrown at these elections course, now. Yeah. But somewhat similar policies being demanded. So first of all, there's this issue of privatizations, which seems to be one of the main objectives during this crisis to get privatizations through. So what does that look like in Europe? Yeah, uh, in, in Italy, the, the letter from the European Central Bank to the, the Berlusconi government said uh, you have to pursue privatization of public services, and this includes water, uh, privatization of water. And in fact, just months before, there had been a referendum in Italy about privatization of water, and, and the voters had rejected it. And now the, the so-called independent, technocratic European Central Bank is coming in and telling them to over, do, uh, overthrow what the, what the people had decided and uh, engage in privatization. Uh, another important goal of, of these kinds of so-called technocratic um, policies is to gut labor protection laws. Uh, in, in Italy, there are strong protections for, uh, in terms of hiring and firing, and what they're trying to impose are these so-called labor flexibility with the idea that this is going to generate more economic growth uh, and um, more employment. But uh, as David Howell uh, from the New School for Social Research, Dean Baker, and others have shown, uh, labor uh, flexibility does, does not lead to more uh, employment and more economic growth. It just leads to lower wages and, and higher profits. The, uh, the other thing, thing that seems to be very much in target or focused on is pensions in all countries. The idea, I guess, of lowering pension age uh, and qualifications. Why is that such a big issue in Europe? Well, uh, it's such a big issue in Europe because that's um, two, for two, two reasons. One is it's a big liability of the government, and so there is a big, uh, uh, a high degree of, of, of budget impact on that. But the second is enough is trying to undermine uh, the the power of labor and forcing workers uh, into the hands of the banks. So if you reduce public pensions, not only do you make make it so that workers have to uh, take any job they can get in order to support themselves and work longer, but it also uh, 
gives more room for private pension plan plans. And as we know from the debate over privatizing Social Security here in the United States, that's been one of the long-term goals of finance. In, indeed, the general uh, push of all of these policies is to gut the welfare state as much as policy and uh, return all of these kinds of protections uh, to profit-making opportunities for banks and other uh, private companies. Is part of what's happening here, if you look at sort of the underlying economic forces at play here, uh, I mean, uh, one part of it is, and we've talked about this on The Real News quite a bit, the, uh, you know, the, uh, the uh, willingness and desire of various elites and financial elites to take advantage of the crisis to undo social policy, New Deal type things in the U.S., welfare safety net in Europe and all that, and, and take advantage of sort of the weaker hand of labor and, and, and people during this crisis as one thing. But is there also another part to this, which is there's just so much capital with nowhere to go that the, because of this uh, unequal distribution of wealth and income, this massive amount of capital in very few hands, and the, and the real economy, not a great place to invest in. So what you need to do is pick apart what there is of the public sector as a place for this capital to go to. Is, par, is that part of what's going on here? Yeah, I think that's, a good, I think that's an important aspect. Um, that they're trying to destroy all of the uh, publicly provided markets to find new markets uh, uh, in, a, in a peri particularly a period of slow growth. Uh, and in particular, a period when they're actually pushing austerity, uh, the size of the, of the overall pie isn't going to grow much. So they have to chip away at uh, previously protected parts of it. Part of what is um, uh, so evil about this whole approach is the, the transformation, the distortion of language that, that is part of it. Uh, the use of the term technocrat uh, to hide the fact that um, Trichet, uh, that, uh, Monty, uh, Draghi, all of these people have very, very close ties to the big banks. Uh, most of them worked at one time or another uh, for Goldman Sachs or other big financial firms. Uh, we have the same kind of thing, of course, in the United States, where we have Larry Summers, who works uh, for the financial sector and makes millions of dollars doing so. Uh, being put forward as a quote-unquote uh, technocrat. Um, we have the Federal Reserve that uh, is um, has engaged, as, as you know, in all kinds of backdoor bailouts of the financial sector, uh, again seen as sort of a, a technocratic solution. But we see the revolving door between the Federal Reserve and the private financial sector. Uh, using the term fiscal consolidation for uh, getting public services and generating unemployment. All of this is Orwellian language, which is meant to obscure what is really going on, uh, which is the takeover of uh, democ democratic control, which, as you said, is already undermined by money. Uh, and put it, putting it firmly, firmly in the hands of, of the financial sector. Yeah, I, I love this, uh, this term technocrat because it, it gives the sense that there's this objective problem with an objective set of policies and the whole society needs to take its medicine. But politicians are too uh, vulnerable to public opinion, so you need some technocrats that are just going to pragmatically do what needs to be done. As if all of this is above interest. And That's has nothing right. to do with the financial sector. I mean, you're right, it's, and, it's pure Orwell. And in the Financial Times, there's an artic article recently talking about the uh, profile of Pathodemos, the, the, the prime minister, the technocratic prime minister there, saying that he was heading up a caretaker government. You know, as if the Greek people are a bunch of infants, infants and they have to, we have to wait till they can grow up and exercise their dem democratic uh, rights. Part of the frustrating thing is that uh, these kinds of... Um, uh, elite pushes to control these democratic systems are possible because the left is so divided in the European countries and it's divided here in the United States as well, of course. Um, part of the uh, left in Italy, for example, didn't protest when this letter came out uh, because they were so focused on just trying to get rid of Berlusconi and they've accepted uh, Monti as a uh, as a, as, a, as a prime minister because they were just so happy to get rid of Berlusconi. So I think there's a, a, a great need for the left forces in all of our countries uh, to really unite uh, to oppose these kinds of policies. We have to break this whole lockhold of, of anti-democratic structures that have been built up by uh, the, the elites under neoliberal policies over the last 20 years uh, so that uh, once uh, we have more democratic elections and vision, 
uh, we actually have the ability to implement them. So I guess at the moment the issue is if people want to take this up, they need to hit the streets. Not a bad idea. Thanks for joining us, Jerry. Thank you. Thank you for joining us on The Real News Network.